Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland International and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT. And we're going to be joined by former Italy centre, Michele Campagnaro, shortly to reflect on a famous result for Italy, if not the win they wanted, obviously. We'll get into a full debrief, Johnny, about what is going on with France at the moment, how bad it is, or if it's maybe not quite as bad as some are making out. But I suppose... We probably have to talk about the Calcutta Cup first. That's where you were. You were in Edinburgh. So go on. England are shit. I don't know what you want me to say. It's delightful to be able to say that, no matter what country you're from. Um, And yeah, first time for Scotland, four times in a row since 1896. 1896, mate. Um, So yeah, exceptional weekend. Good fun. Murrayfield absolutely bouncing, as was the corporate, catching up with everyone. And a couple of beers afterwards in Edinburgh. Um, but yeah, Eng- England, honestly, Scotland won that in third gear with 40% possession. England, mm. England being bad is more the story. That is what I came away. That was my take coming away from it is that they are properly in a hole now. And I have no idea how they're going to get out of it with all the resource, with all the players. I know they've had reduced teams in the premiership, but still they've got 10x, 15x the amount of players talent um that scotland does so to see how easy at times that was for scotland how poor england were with the ball um was eye-opening to say the least enough about that if england yeah. are bad well, let's talk france because they weren't great oh. at the weekend but there are a lot of headlines some over here i'm sure loads in france one over here was saying the end of a golden age for france which is surely overstating it because given the age profile of the side, the talent, the depth they have in France, not on the playing side, it's not the end of a generation at all. But we've spoken a bit about the sort of support that France had in the lead up to a home World Cup, slightly reduced now in terms of the squad size. It's obviously tense because it's a new coaching staff and things are not going well. It's a critical period in terms of them not making a knee-jerk reaction, right? Yeah, it just me. it needs managed gently and smartly we had florian grill the french president came out not the country of the ffr came out and said fabian galtier's job is not in danger the guy's got a contract through to the end of the 2027 world cup realistically the ffr doesn't have the resource to be able to sack him he's on such a big contract they'd have to pay him out millions if they're going to fire him um and i genuinely don't think what's happening at the minute and i know normally we say the buck stops with a head coach I just think there's a lot going on in and around. And if you look back at the games, and this is why there's such an angry reaction in France at the minute, is because they've been used to having such a resurgent, well-organized, efficient team. They've been pretty ruthless and really nice to follow for the past three, four years, right? So French public's been spoiled. Um, And we've now had three results, maybe four. So exit the World Cup, that aside. Ireland, still probably the number one side in the world demolished scotland performance was abject but they won the game um but drawing with italy that has been a new low and, and if we're for being honest they should have lost that game um mm. if it if it was for the if it wasn't for the red card i think they'd have won it comfortably yeah i mean i mean comfortably at canter the first 40 minutes i think they made six entries and not six entries they made six minutes they had six yeah. minutes camped inside red zone and they just couldn't convert and I think with all the sort of hysteria, everything blowing around, all the media noise, it's weird. The players, to me, look like they've kind of gone away from a little bit what I know as Fabian Galtier's strengths, which are amazing starter plays, getting you over the gain line, and then working as a team to finish those things and then nail opportunities. It almost looks like in the chaos and the noise and the sort of stadium that's obviously expectant, it's almost one-off problem fixing. They're all like serial by go and get over the gain line. Then the ball pops out. Somebody else, go and go. Over the, like, there's no, normally it's you're off nine. There's a certain point that you attack that I know from working with Fabian. There's a certain area or there's an option of a pop pass. There's a unit and there's a clear beyond the ball. Gain line achieved, then it's the next phase and it's maybe slightly further out or it's back ball. And all those little things with the forwards, it just looks frantic. It doesn't look like Fabian's got his stamp on it. And I just think he needs to take them back in Lads, settle. We've had a red card. I know that's changed the game. It completely changed the dynamics and they fell apart. Um, but back up to 15 with a full complement, 
you can also remember we spoke about it last week like they're missing eight of their best players that isn't the same of any of the other six nations teams at the minute so you got for different reasons you got Dupont, who's in Vancouver, you got Intermac, you got Aldrit, you got Thibaut Flamand, you got Miafu, you got Jalanche, you got Marchand working his way back. So you've got, what, five eights of the pack, and you're starting nine, ten aren't there. Um, and the players know that as well. The players feel that, and they've spoken about that over the past month that the seven or eight of their top boys aren't there. So it's a difficult period, but it is what it is. Like, there's no point in panicking. Fabian is the best coach over here at the minute. It's just settle. We'll use the last two games to maybe blood a bit of youth. Um, we saw Tulagi have a pretty decent impact for 50 minutes against the Italians. Um, he's come up well. I expect Miafu to get capped in the next two games. Um, and I think it's just about being patient, building back those performances that we've been so used to over the past four years in that cycle. Um, yeah, nothing, nothing knee jerk because what's the point? What's the point to be knee jerk at this stage? And you mentioned that that coaching message that we've seen obviously get across over the past four years doesn't seem to be getting across in these opening few games obviously we've talked about the new assistant coaches that's going to take time to bed in is there a danger that the players are not responding to him and that message is sort of worn out because after a certain period of time sometimes that does happen is there a danger of that or not it's exactly what happened in Montpellier when we were there as club, and that that was what he said, and that was what he said internally to us, and I think too from memory to the the sort of board of the club to Moed Altrad was that the message isn't getting over anymore, um, and I think that when bridges are burned and there's personal things come in and you're in a club environment, that's one thing, but I I genuinely don't think that applies to the French national team. I can understand Montpellier if if things happen and relationships break down, but you're going to the French team, you're going to the pinnacle of your rugby career. Um, it's not about relationships. It's about going there for what a five week period and performing. Um, and I still believe that the technical and the strategic element of what we've seen over the past four seasons is top quality. And he has, I mean, you think that opening game against the All Blacks, they've, they've demolished some of the top tier of world rugby um, in the past four years. They've beaten everybody. So yeah, there's a danger of, again, being knee-jerk and saying, well, it needs change. I, I don't think it does. And I don't think that the players um, would throw Fabian under the bus either because I think they've known that they've been part of something very, very special and that the French side, if you speak to a Mathieu Bastro or a Shuli or any of these boys that were part of it during the difficult years, they were extremely envious and have been very, very jealous of this French side over the past um, three, four seasons. So yeah, look, I don't think we're at a stage where that will happen. Um, and I think the players understand how lucky they are to be working with a coach of Fabian's quality. Um, but I do think they need some sort of internal reset. Not a reset, but I think it's just going to take time for the players to come back from injury, who are their leaders, and for whatever it's going to be line out, wherever it's going to be multi-phase, start plays, all these things to click back into place for them to find the level that we've been used to seeing. Um, so yeah, I think that's going to be patience. It's going to be hard for the players because they're not patient. They just want to get out and perform. Mm. But I think for French rugby public, for media and for supporters, it's going to take, you know, five to 10 games before we see them back at the level that we're all hoping for, I'd say. And from the evidence you've seen on the pitch, you don't see cause for concern that he might have lost the dressing room. No, I don't think it's a dressing room thing. Um, there's, a, there's a difference. And I saw it was Bernard Jackman, friend of the show, uh, hmm. Speaking with Jim and Hoggy, he was saying that I think there might be the be tension between Fabian and French media. That's one thing. But I think internally, in terms of performance and the squad and the hands on of what you're going out and producing, that doesn't affect that. And um, just because there's a bit of ruffled feathers and people are starting to get prickly in the press doesn't mean that players are going to start turning their heads or being like, oh, this guy's terrible. They know, they, they know what they've achieved, they know how good this guy You got to think back to like record score Twickenham. How long ago was that? Less than a year, yeah. I mean, I mean, they they stuck 50 plus on England last year at Twickenham. Um, so the quality is still there. Um, the parts to building performances that are top class are still there. I, I just think with assistants that have changed and a lot of players out, it's, it's just going to take a little bit of patience, that's all. But I think they'll be back and they will be one of the top four or five nations in the world fairly regularly um, under Fabian's stewardship. Um, it's just going to take a little bit of time. 
And yeah, big sample size for how well they did, sort of 30, 40 games under Fabian Galtier between 2019, building towards 2023. Very small sample size of it going wrong over the past three or four games. You mentioned he isn't going to get the sack, in your opinion, from the FFR. They don't have the budget to do it. And also, why would they, based on the body of evidence? Is there a danger then, because of that relationship with the French media public, you know Fabian, that he might jump rather than be pushed or not? I don't think so. I can't think where he'd want to jump to. Just an emotive reaction, I suppose. I, I just, I don't know where he would go. Um, in that, you know, he's done Clubland, he's done Stade Francais, he's done Toulon, he's done Montpellier, he's been part of the Argentinian setup. This now is the holy grail for him. He's a former French captain, former player of, uh, former world player of the year, uh, now leading French rugby on a world stage. And I, I think this is the ultimate for him. And I think he's had a taste, you know, you go back three months ago, he was talking about leading France not through just this World Cup coming 2027, but the one after that too. He was like, why not? I'd love to. This is, and it is, I, I genuinely believe this is the job. If you're a French rugby coach, this is the one that everyone wants. I think personally for him, after having been through the volatility of Toulon and Montpellier and Stade Francais, this is the top of the tree. So when we say, would he jump? I mean, there'd have to be something very, very lucrative and completely different for him to to hop into. But I just don't see that opportunity for him at the moment in the top 14. And in terms of the nuts and bolts on the pitch, obviously, prior to the Italy game, we spoke about how the set piece was really struggling. That did improve. Like Against Italy, their set piece was was okay. In the scrum, they were certainly dominant for a period. Then Italy came back. The line-out wasn't too bad at all. What has happened to France's discipline, Johnny? They had one yellow card in the last Mate. 11 games prior to the tournament. Two yellows, two reds. So they've played uh, nearly half, 110 minutes out of 240 minutes so far, down to 14 men. You can't win games like that, can you? No, and I I do not know the answer here in that they're normally so squeaky clean. And maybe it is the backdrop and context of all the noise of French media, the discontent, and it's then, well, we'll try extra hard. on Like Joe, Joe Dante, case in point, mm. it, I'm trying extra hard to come up and show everyone that I am keen as mustard because people have been very critical of him and, and Fiku in the centres. What are they doing? Why have they been so poor? As they have been the halfbacks, they haven't had any ball. So Joe Dante, there's his opportunity to get off the line, make an impact, make his physical presence felt, and he's mistimed it horribly. Like head on head, and that's it. The game's gone. So... I don't know. I, I think these are all mental factors of well, as well that have come into play because things have not been going well. And on field, they've been trying or maybe going a little bit OTT. And that's one. And then as we know, as soon as you go down to 14, rugby is a game of pressure. And as soon as your defensive system is shot, you can't have the line speed you want. You're trying to absorb, you're soaking. Pressure and psychological factors mean that you go off and problem solve in isolation. You do weird things, both sides of the ball in attack and defense. So we just saw France again in the first half where honestly, I thought they looked really comfortable. Um, but that red card has completely changed the mechanism, the dynamics of the game. And then the second period is penalty after penalty because they feel like they're playing with an arm chopped off. They've got their go forward and Joe Dante that's gone and they feel like they have to do something different. And that's when you exit or you come out of the structure that you've been given and you try to do extra as an individual and it, it never works. So it's weird. It's a weird bit of rugby and it's purely psychological. But again, France's discipline has just gone to absolute tatters after that one instant because up until then, they looked very, very safe, easy and looked like they're going to win the game at a canter. Even if they played the same style and the same brand, you think, okay, first period, they've had six minutes and 22. They haven't converted. It's been a bit scrappy, but if they get that again... It's going to be a bonus point, went easily. Um, so yeah, frustration for them. And again, it'll be horrible for Joe Dante, having been there myself. It's not a nice place to be. And he'll take that solely, that's so responsible. He'll feel the whole weight of French rugby right now on his shoulders, which is not a nice place to be. And another quick one on a couple of the assistant coaches, because it might just be time. <clears throat> and we might be sat here in a few weeks time saying, oh, we've seen some improvements, give it a bit more time. But obviously we were so used to seeing under Thibaut Giroud, France's fitness through the roof. Nicolas Jean-Jean obviously works under Thibaut Giroud, so there shouldn't be a yeah. great deal of difference, you would think. And obviously people have referred to the fact that there's been a lot of games back to back in the top 14. The players are playing more than some of the other nations' players. Maybe that's the reason. So that's one. And then the attack, you mentioned how much time they spent in the 22. By the end of the game, it was 10 visits, one try. Obviously, that isn't a good enough conversion rate. You get one more than that and you've won the game. 
It's as simple as that. So is that just it, it not clicking? Because Patrick Arletta is obviously the attack coach. He surely didn't have to rip things up because it was pretty good before. Physically, I can understand why the players are wrecked. Like they're the only country to come back from the World Cup. Everyone's gone straight back on the horse and they've knocked together something like 14 games consecutively. No other country's done that. So that I can understand. And for there to be, you know, comparisons between Thibaut Giroud, who like is top class, and Jean Jean, who also is, is a great bloke. Like Jean Jean's got he's got nothing to do in that you basically are hoping everyone is not injured and you're getting them through training sessions and then getting them on the field. Like there's not much prep, right? It's not like the World Cup where there was criticism for Thibault and the injuries and the soft tissue things. This is what state are the players in? How much energy have they got? And get them through Test Match Rugby, which is Six Nations, against other nations who are primed for this period. They have enforced rest periods because they're union controlled. So that's very different. Um, the attack is the one bit that I'm really struggling with. Um, in the Arletas has come in from Perpignan who were basement of top 14 there's not much that we've seen uh, and again like knowing Fabian as I do Patrick's maybe going to be responsible for some of the starter plays getting them over the gain line but then once you get into multi-phase the templates and how they want to play I'm assuming are completely the same the three quarters will go off and have their specialist training during the week with Patrick and Fabian but I mean how much influence is he meant to have again the first few games no lineups won no ball no nothing this game, it was almost like everybody, irrespective of irrespective of starter plays or what was going on, it was like hot potato. It was just get me the ball. I want to carry. I want to get on the go on the front foot by myself. It didn't look like a team, so it doesn't really come from your three quarter coach. That is a sort of team ethos and mindset that needs to be sort of reined back in, lads. I know you're trying really hard, but we've got structures and systems that we stick to, and that's how we've blitzed teams off the field in the past twenty four months. So. It is weird, mate. And there's lots of criticism and criticism obviously get chucked about when things are not going well, but like the assistants need time to settle. The line out was much better with a positive serve out. will be absolutely delighted with the scrum. You had Antonio with Tuilagi. Like, I don't know if you saw the weight packs at the start of the game, but they yeah. had like a hundred, hundred kilo advantage, which is incredible. Um, but it just comes back to my point initially, which is time. Like all these things, assistant coaches, new players, new players coming in. Uh, getting their first caps. Um, it's going to be rocky, right? Um, but France have got the natural playing power. Um, but given, again, as we've seen, five, six, seven test matches under their belt. Again, summer tour this season will be very important. It'll be interesting to see who gets bled on that tour. Um, but I guess the tricky part for them now is all... Is they don't have time. They've got two more test matches in the Six Nations to finish as high up as they can. And, and really, if we're to be very critical... France were humbled in the first test match against Scotland and the TMO decision could have seen that ball going another way. And I'm fairly sure with our guest in a minute, we're going to we're gonna pick apart how and why Italy didn't win that game with another TMO decision that should have been. So could be out from three. It, they could very easily be zero points from the first three games. Um, so yeah, looking forward to seeing what our guest thinks of that because I know a lot of people were not too happy. Let's get an Italian perspective on that famous resort in Lille now then. And we can have a chat with friend of the show and your neighbour, Johnny, former Italy centre Michaela Campagnaro joins us. How you doing? Uh, very good, thank you. Thank you for having me back. Thank you for coming back on. I think we have to start paying you if you come back on again. So after <laughs> this, so maybe, maybe this will be it, Michaela. <laughs> uh, it's, all good. it's all good. Let's talk about Italy first and the, the controversial ending in Lille. Let's get straight to the point. Should Paolo Garbisi have been allowed to retake his penalty should the clock shot clock have been stopped or was it just unfortunate what happened uh I, you know I've, I've followed the like uh you know the comments after the game and and i just think like uh at their level with uh with such a um, with such a big uh, game uh you know uh you need to be careful in the details and you know if it comes to down to like retake the penalty you should allow him to retake the penalty or like just the referee you know bear in mind every single you know rule in their moment which is you know their opponents cannot move and do whatever they want to distract him so I think a little bit more uh, uh, you know attention on the details at the end would be probably uh, cost uh, yeah uh, Italy the win. So there's two parts to this there's 
if the ball falls off a tee and it's not the fault of a player, surely the clock should be reset because why wouldn't you be allowed the time to take a ball? It's not like your time wasting. And the second yeah. part is the French players, as it fell, then charged Garbisi down. So surely on that second count, it should have been reset. Surely he should have been allowed to take a kick again. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure, you know, on the rule if the ball falls or not, you should stop the time. But I think the, the rule is clear when someone moves and, like, try to clearly distract the kicker. You know, that's, you know, that's time consuming, that's like distraction for the, and, you know, we know how high pressure is to kick, you know, to, to kick penalties. And especially in such a crucial time, a crucial game, like, you know, you can't allow the opposition to, you know, really mess with the, with the kicker head. And I think that's what really happened there. And I know that Paolo is, you know, he's taking his responsibility and already said after the game, like, he doesn't want, you know, um, these uh these kind of like uh, comments to be an excuse for him but you know i think you know you should uh you should definitely have to retake a penalty there yeah johnny i think in the laws obviously with a penalty you're not allowed to charge it a conversion you are allowed mm -hmm. to charge it but with a penalty it's slightly ambiguous isn't it because you're definitely not allowed to charge it and you could argue that at least one of those french players was charging it but if they weren't charging and they were just moving that's allowed. It's unsportsman. Like, like as McKaylee said, it is going to potentially put Paolo Garbisi off, but you don't have to stand still once he started his run up. But if you get within 10 meters again, that's another penalty 10 meters further ahead. So Sebastian Taffer, for no, I don't know whether he was within 10 meters or not, but it was certainly close. He was close enough. There was two. It wasn't just Tao. There was another player yeah. who was closer. Can't remember who it was, but there's certainly reason, again, in my mind, I was like, that is going to be reset and a 10 meter gain, which wasn't given. And at least it was going to be retaken. So, mate, it's a shocker because I thought that was going to be the first Italian win away against the French in the Six Nations. It's not to be, and that would have been hugely historic, right? For this current crop of players, for Gonzalo Quesada as well, going back and coaching against a lot of players that he knows really well, that would have been a huge result for Italy. Yeah, and I think it's he it also deserved in terms of, you know, the performance, especially in the second half and the defence in the first half. Like, uh, we put ourselves in a really, you know, good uh, good position and, uh, and you know, call it like, you know, unfortunate time or whatever, like it's it wasn't, it wasn't meant to be, but... Um, yeah, it's a shame because opportunities like these don't come that often, especially into Italy. And you know, with uh, with confidence and hope that they will, because I think results are showing that, especially like down the twenties and you know, like the whole Italian movement with the Treviso, like you know, winning a lot, and that will keep hope to the Italians to you know be in this situation again and probably win the game. So. Yeah, let's try to stay positive from from this uh, unfortunate moment. Yeah, it's not the win, but it, even a draw away at France, I suppose the way it unfolded, as you said, first half defence was very good. Johnny and I spoke about how the, the French attack was, was pretty poor when they got into the 22, but yeah. Italy made a huge number, over 100 tackles in the first half and, and really did a good job keeping France out. And then the red card obviously turned things. And then the second half potentially Italy could have taken one more chance and then they would have got the win. But generally, the try was great and they looked like they were doing things in attack that we perhaps haven't seen recently. We, uh, I think I've, I've seen like a much, um, you know, uh, a step forward in, in on the, the attack perspective in the last few years with the, with Kieran Crowley and with all these exciting players like Menoncello and and and, and Capozzo, you know, like it's it's been great to see, great to watch. Um, and I think definitely they show that way more in the second half. And in the first half, they were like, not really. I mean, they had opportunities, but they, you know, um, they weren't really attacking a lot. Um, it's also true that France had you know, a red car, and we all know that when French like have a red car, or they like they start like panicking a little bit. Uh, thing goes south, and they you you saw that like they were like chucking balls around. They were like they've been French in in that in that regard, and that of course helped us. Um, but you know, yeah, it's just, 
hopefully we'll take that you know second half into the you know, next two games and you know that confidence to win games you know until the end yeah and what have you seen so far that you've liked Gonzalo Casada has just come in new coach at this level his first shot as a head coach at international level but when you look and you see how the back line's operating the sort of pivot around Brex are you enjoying the way they play are you enjoying the new style I think uh, from what I've heard and you know like and probably what we can see as well that there hasn't been like a drastic change and and there wasn't his whole point is like you know I'm not gonna come in and change after the squad change the way we play like you know the defense the defense coach is the same and he didn't want to like bring too many changes at once um and uh i think you can see that they still have like a dna of i think that this the squad and the previous cycle with kieran uh, because most of the players are the same um but yeah, i think he's definitely probably brought out like you know his experience like let's say in france okay but um some as we were saying last time, like the the the, the good man that he is to like bring the squad together. And I saw like especially after the game, every player like, you know, a head up and you know, I tried to, you know, the group is the most important things. And I think that's probably what he's, he's trying to do, like to create like a, a solid group of players that, you know, can deal with different situations and on under the rugby side of side of view, I think we will see more in the next few few months and few years. And when we spoke at the World Cup, it was I think it was between the the unfortunately the hammering by the All Blacks and the hammering by France. But yeah. one of the main criticisms that we all sort of discussed and was very much evident to anyone watching really was that Italy had developed this good attacking style but they used it from too deep. They played too much rugby in their own half and in their own 22 at times. So have you seen evidence that that is not happening under Gonzalo Casada as we expected? And also in the lead up to this France game, he made a big point and Johnny referenced it there. I mean, not many teams have humans of the size of Pasola, Tuolangi and Willy Antonio, but the Italy side was very much smaller and lighter. So therefore you have to be smart tactically, do you? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think, uh, you know, as we were saying, like, you know, last time for sure, uh, they're probably kicking a bit more and you know be more strategic under the point of view. Um, we, you know, we saw what happened with Tommaso Allen not being, you know, in the squad, and that changed probably a bit, like putting Paolo back in, uh, you know, as a as the main uh, main main guy with the tactical choices, and you know, he's he's a guy that. Uh, He's very good, you know, bowling end, but he's also a, a really good kicker. Um, and uh, I think I don't know a lot of Pajarello, the number nine, but I think he's also like a pretty good strategic player, which is very, you know, helpful if you if you if he puts you in the right in the right part of uh, of the field to play. So yeah, I think going forward, you do need yeah these uh, these kind of players, this kind of tactic for sure. Do you know what's got me thinking this game and looking back at the World Cup? It's have France gone backwards or have Italy moved? I can't get my head around. Have Italy improved lots or were France just very poor and they got a red card? What do you yeah. think? Like I think Italy is, is improving and that's, that's like a, a fact also. You, you saw the world ranking, like, you know, it's not... It's not that oh you know we had a good performance. I think over the last two years, yes, we are like you know pretty bad games in the in the World Cup because I don't know like you know of course they were great, France and 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 all the were great, uh, but also there was like a change of cycle. Like probably people were in the right space, but overall I think performance wise we've been way more competitive. Um, and you know, I think it's been eleven years since we were like in the first ten of the war rankings. So that's that's already showing you that we're progressing. So I think we are progressing, but France is definitely like not the same level. And I don't know if it's because Galtier has been there for too long now, or like if because how I said it from the start of the uh, start of the championship, you know, like France without the opponent, the mark is is not France. And even though like 
they're such a great players and um and it's a great like top 14 is a great league and everything like you know those two like change the whole squad and i think there's no other teams where you can sh see that uh so much as you can see when uh when nine and ten of france they're not playing another guy that you mentioned a moment ago was tommy allen and he's gone yeah. back to club i'm not sure if you saw the tribes involved in at the weekend like an absolute screamer so he seems to be back and happy and on form but he stepped away from the italian setup i'm wondering if you if you spoke to him and if it was just a case of like that blend of mental and physical exhaustion and being away from family or, or what it was that took him to sort of pull himself back a little bit from italian involvement yeah i think like um i, I sent you a message uh, a few days ago i said look man uh, let's let's catch up soon and uh, I, I meant to call in this week because uh, i just want to you know let him be like process stay with the family but um yeah i I think honestly, you know, you see more and more in rugby where like, you know, it's it's more common, but it's more normal to have like, you know, problems or like to have more like uh you know being always uh perfect, not be always like uh wanting to play for your country and putting maybe family first. And I think that was his case. Of course, I think he was was a lot like physically, mentally for the last couple of years, but also, you know. He moved club. He was, you know, he was away with the, with the, with the World Cup, and then, you know, he has a little kid and and his wife. Like the, it, it's, you know, when you have no family around, and we can see a bit as well. Like when you have no family around, and it's a lot for the partners, and it's a lot, I think, also for the players, you know, to deal, you know, all these things, all these emotions, all these problems by by themselves. So. Hopefully, like he will, he will come back, you know, soon and you know, stronger than before. And with Tommy not there, you mentioned Paolo Garbisi steps up. He has more of a prominent role in terms of running the game. It also changes selection in other areas yeah. of the field. In your opposition in centre, you yeah. had Menoncello and Brex sort of developing a partnership, and then all of a sudden they went yeah. with Mori and Brex and shifted Menoncello out to the wing. So, what? is your view on what the best sort of Italian lineup is in the backs? I think, and you can see that like, like a lot of um, coaches have this mentality. Like sometimes it's, it's not really who's, who's my two best centers. Who's like, you know, my best backs, you know, who's my like, uh, you know, my best backs that I can put on, uh, on, uh, on the pitch. And in this case, I think that what came down to like Menoncello is you put him 12, 13 wing is probably the best, you know, uh, with Capozzo Italian player. Uh, so with Mori, you know, I think having like a very good season in with, with Bayonne and, you know, like he missed, I think he missed be like chances in uh, with Italy. Uh, you you look at the you look at the the squad and yeah is a is a bit of a change for Brex but again like the way that they play I think for Brex doesn't matter if you're thirteen or or twelve like under the attack point of view like he's kind of like second uh, second playmaker uh, and uh, he is leading the defense on the thirteen so that's there's not a big big change for I think for them and. You know, um, yeah. And on Menoncello, you mentioned there he's uh, Ange Capuazzo takes the the headlines and understandably so, brilliant player. But a lot of hype is building around Tommaso Menoncello. How yeah. strong is he? Apparently, he lifts as much as some of the forwards. And is it not yeah. best to get him in a position where he can get his hands on the ball a bit more? I mean, yeah, like uh, you know, he's uh, he's probably you know I haven't had the chance to actually play. I trained I trained with him a couple of times and. Um, but yeah, I think it's probably one of the strongest and fastest play that the you know they have had the chance to you know see him play with. Um, he's young, he's really young, and I think he needs to develop some you know under some some part of his game, and uh, that's why I think uh, yes, I think at twelve it would be it be great, uh, but maybe like there's a part of his game that needs to you know improve. Uh, probably like be the best 12 you know for for italy where like on the wing you know he just he just uh, well like one really 
thing to do which is just catch the ball and you know like you know just try to make as many meters as possible and that's what he does best you know but I think he, we will see him like progress in law in the next few years. Another man we've seen progress loads and win the top 14 is Paolo Garbisi. Obviously a difficult weekend for him and again in the background he's got a move to Toulon that's just happened as well so how do you think Paolo's going to get on down at Toulon and how did that move come around? Incredible scenes in top 14. I, from what I've heard, and I've spoke with him, but he's been he's been a bit hectic because uh, you know, like uh, the club didn't really communicate very well with him, and uh, and he just you know just left like that, and he was uh, he was pretty upset that you know after like going there and you know winning the league after so many years and all these kind of things there was like so little empathy over over you know his his transfer so definitely that you know plays a bit be on his mind but i think in Toulon he's gonna find like more like you know sergio and then andrea masi as coaches and you know he's he's still like he still is like a very good player which is you know very rare to have like someone that can cover 10 and 12 the way they does uh and hopefully we'll see him progressing you know even more you know there with the with with Toulon. yeah paolo said it publicly didn't he johnny montpellier didn't say anything at all to him and after you've led them to a top 14 title I mean, that is odd but you know montpellier that's that's them all over it to a certain extent i guess i mean yes and no i mean I mean, the backroom staff, like the coaches are completely, all it takes is a coach to put an arm around them or like say, this is what we're thinking or have a word or but if none of the staff who, to be fair, have all just arrived as well. Yeah. So it's quite, it's quite a strange situation for them. But if nobody from the sporting side of the staff, none of the coaches and none of the backroom staff, nobody in who's organizing contracts or doing recruitment, Philippe Saint-André has obviously just left as well. So, but the fact that nobody takes the time to have that base level of respect for the player and outline what they're thinking, the views of the clubs, a potential change. You've obviously got Chris Tolafu has come the other way, um, but he's been trying to orchestrate that move himself for a long time. So he knew, but for Paolo not to know, and I don't know, to be slid a piece of paper or told, look, thank you very much for winning us the top 14, but it's time to go. Like it's cruel. And that is the shit side of any professional sport. When clubs and organizations don't get it right and they don't communicate properly, can leave a bitter taste in the mouth um so i just hope with it and again short term he'll be like what the fuck but i hope that long term he'll look back philosophically and just remember the good times he had winning titles with the club and performing because when he did he was absolutely phenomenal and he's a great guy a lot to do with agents and the power they have involved in this as well but that's probably a long story for another day, another day johnny but strange the way it's unfolded but there are worse places to end up for Paolo than toulon and i'm sure i'm sure he will do very well there he'll be absolutely fine bass they'll put his arm around him he'll be <laughs> absolutely fine mate another man again we're talking about unhappy italians this is not a good theme uh another <laughs> Franco-Italian, who wasn't happy at the weekend, was Ange Capuazzo. I'm not sure if you saw his comments after the game, that he wasn't happy with the whistling, with the lack of respect from the French rugby public, and it wasn't a good representation of France. Now, he's French, essentially, born in Grenoble, so he can say it. And I'm wondering, you watching the game, watching it unfold, you must have been thinking the same thing. The amount of whistles, and I couldn't decide if that was aimed at Italians and kickers or was aimed at the French and their own side being poor during the game what did you make of it so I really like sometimes you I don't know uh, you wonder why they were sitting or you wonder to whom but I think that's what French like to do like complain complain and you know like try to <laughs> try to you know like distract and we we saw that like it's the only country in the world that were like when you're kicking that like, people like banging and whistling like there's no respect under that point of view, but I don't know if it's just because of the cultural thing that, you know, they, they, they've been raised like that and that's normal and that's, that's what they do. But yeah, coming from, from Anja, I think it's, yeah, it's definitely, um, it's not good because, you know, he's technically French because he, you know, he, he lived uh, all his life here. So, um, yeah, it's it's not great. I don't think is uh, is the right way to do it, and uh, you always need to to show respect, you know, 
if he's on the stadium or social media, it doesn't matter. Just like, you know, we human beings try to give you the best, uh, the best uh, match and rugby possible. So, you know, you don't have to bring everybody down, I guess. Well, that's enough negativity, Johnny. Enough. Sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> you you mentioned the under twenties, Michele, and Johnny gave the Italy under twenties the meter moment of the week a couple of weeks ago when they so nearly beat Ireland away, oh, yeah. and now they did beat France for the first time in their history. They are looking really good. There's a massive six foot four winger, Marco Scalabrone, looks pretty good. He looks like he's almost made for senior rugby already. And then obviously it's more difficult in the front row. But that scrum at Italy under 20 level, that must make all of Italy sort of think, well, pretty soon we're going to have a set piece that is going to be more than competitive at senior level. But it is difficult to make that step up. So how soon do you think we're going to see some of those guys involved in the senior side? Look, I think Italy always had a, had a decent decent scrub, a scrum. Like one of the, like the prop were like the only, back in the day, the only... Um, guys they were like getting contracts you know overseas and and i don't know why because you know he's a, he's a very weird <laughs> it's like georgians you know they only produce props and <laughs> but um no scrum well, i think you know we've been always good and you especially uh in, in the 20s that, that can make such a big difference so uh I, i'm not sure because we still have you know kind of like young ish prop in in the you know with italy now you know they know like 35 or anything i think the oldest the oldest one like uh 29 if i'm not if i'm not because ferrari is the is, is the older one i think and he's 29 so yeah ferrari cecciarelli they're both probably the most senior oh, yeah, Ch- yeah cecciarelli is uh i think he's 31 mm. so you're still like a young uh, and the second half they you know they pretty dominated the, the french the french uh, scrum as well so uh i think he's gonna be a really competitive uh role for sure but yeah i hope that you know they will keep producing these young young guys that will raise the bar for for the old squad the thing i've enjoyed most has been ness and dorma i'm not sure if you've yes. seen it but have you seen <laughs> The youngster singing after match for the under twenties. He was like, good. He's amazing. I'm but like, watching what? it, watching it, I'm like, surely that could become the the Italian side's unofficial anthem that gets sung in every single stadium. It'd be amazing <laughs> if that was sung. But how good was that young guy? Ireland have two anthems as well. They have Ireland's call. Can't we have the Italian anthem and then next the Dorma afterwards? <laughs> no, they definitely need like uh, we definitely need a song, but. No, he, he was unbelievable. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know if he did anything when he was younger, like some, you know, lyric shit. But um, yeah, o- hopefully he will like keep us uh, uh, keep us entertained with his performance uh, very very soon. Yeah, he's he's getting straight called up to the seniors, Johnny. His scrummaging's pretty good, but his singing alone gets him in the side. Yeah, exactly. Just for team building, he's there, <laughs> right, mate? So if you were to sum up, let's write off. The Italian game away in Dublin because it seems like yeah. Ireland are maybe a step above the rest at the minute. I'd say you're probably quite happy with the performance against England, happy with the performance against France. Scotland at home next in Rome. How do you think the Italians are going to get on? It's going to be a big one because uh, you know Scotland has been, been looking really, really good, um, and uh, I think they, they were like, very unlucky with, with France. But um, and Scotland at home since years ago, since when I was playing, like it was, you know, is is the game that we need to win, and is the game that we can win, and you know, every year was the same, or every two years was the same thing. Um, so especially after this weekend, the boys are gonna be like pumped and very positive for it. Um, but Scotland is looking really good, so uh, definitely gonna hopefully be a tight game and uh you know if they come down to one kick and then i hope the referee will keep an eye on the opposition but i bet italy, I, I bet i bet italy to ruin the, the scotland dream to you know win a six scotland at home and wales away i mean we could be talking about uh, 50 50 six there. nations two wins a draw like uh, you never know you never know you never know but 
Nah, you know, also need to be realistic. It's going to be hard on. Uh, so, you know, I wish them all the best. Absolutely. And on you, Michele, we found out last time we spoke to you around the World Cup time that you were moving down to Johnny's neck of the woods. So are you there now? Are you settled in? Is he taking you for lunch? Yeah, no, the guy is too busy. <laughs> he's never yeah, there. He's, he's, he only think about money and, you know, how to make money. <laughs> so he's a family friend that doesn't know. Nothing, no. At least he'll be paying nothing. for lunch. When he does take you for lunch, he'll be paying for <laughs> Hey, we are meant to be going for lunch on Tuesday with the missuses. It has been there a busy go. period. Double date. <laughs> We're double dating. Maddie yeah. and Jen, they're along for the ride. Well, they're definitely yeah. not paying those two freeloaders, so they'll be fine. <laughs> um but mate, like again, like you'd finished with Colombia, you were looking for a club. Are you now just not looking for a club? You haven't signed anywhere, you are you moved on to other things? What's happening? Yeah, no, you know, we moved here and, you know, I, I I kept, like, option open if there was something like coming in as I told you guys for, like, as a medical joker or or something like that and it was worthwhile, I would have uh, taken it, but that didn't happen, nothing came through, so, you know, uh, I just um, I just started thinking about my future and kind of project, you know, myself in the next world and next part of my life which is hopefully the next you know 30 years 40 years of uh working career and um yeah i'm i'm i will start soon like um like a degree like um yeah like a degree in carpentry which cool is that if you have any if you have any issue with your roof or anything you know to call <laughs> If you need any shelves putting up, Johnny, you're always busy. Just invite <laughs> Michaela around while you're away. <laughs> I'll let you do that. <laughs> and is that is that going to be the kind of thing? Are you going to do that in French? Or is that going to be like, yeah. where are you getting your degree from? So you're studying here yeah. in France. Yeah, it's a big school here in France. It's called Le Compagnon de Duvar. It's, um, it's a renovated school that um, does all like the um, work like professional work, like, you know, builder, like, um, you know, carpenter, all these kind of things. And um, so, yeah, we'll start there soon, which again, as we were saying, you know, last time, uh, the system is pretty well. So that's, they all paid from the government. So I'm like, you know, in, they call it reconversion professional. There you go. They have a very good accent there. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, I'll be yeah, like I'll be a carpenter, and hopefully, you know, uh, that goes all well, and I will start my my own thing in the next few years. Who knows? A big good luck with the carpentry, Michele. I look forward to seeing the um, table you've built for Johnny when I come over. Thanks very much for coming on and giving us your view on Italy. And most importantly, you've got a few days to so just look up the most expensive restaurant in La Ben, and he'll see you there next Tuesday. Front of the sea. Michelin star. <laughs> Mate, we're, we're going to the place in the bend next to the train station called La Jolla. The table's booked. <laughs> and it's 18 euros menu of the day. Why include oh. it for four? So we're in. <laughs> Cheers, yeah. McKenna. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, guys. See you, mate. Catch you on Tuesday. Thank you. Bye-bye. Johnny, that's outrageous. You've booked the cheapest restaurant in La Ben. Mate, it's the best restaurant in La Ben. This is the thing. <laughs> Sometimes it's one and the same, isn't it? Mate, I think it's 18 or 19 euros and it is absolutely phenomenal. This is okay. the difference. That, that sounds like not a lot of money. So people back in the UK will be like, oof, that sounds terrible. But for 20 euros, you can eat like a king. It's absolutely class. So no, looking forward to it. Um, be good to get the girls together as well. Maddie, his missus, just arrived as American um, and doesn't have too many contacts in the area. So no, mate, looking forward to taking them both out. Good feed couple of glasses of wine at lunch can i say that yeah my employers yeah it'll be all right they'll be fine um yeah looking forward to meeting them properly catching up and uh seeing how they get on in la ben my little village you take him for lunch he builds you a new drinks cabinet everyone's happy i was thinking more staircase actually like something oh, really God, time consuming <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that's good like it's nice to hear what players are going to do afterwards and you wouldn't necessarily think michele campagnari carpenter but i like it it sounds like it sounds like a carpenter name. It sounds like he's mm. going to be a really high end Italian French designer that's going to sell ridiculous things and make loads. Like it sounds cool, doesn't it? Like John B. E. Carpenter doesn't sound cool, whereas <laughs> Campagnaro <laughs> Italian carpentry sounds pretty cool. You're putting up shelves and he's building sculptures. Yeah, mate, I'll be lucky if I can get those shelves up. Yeah, I'm absolutely useless. <laughs> whereas he's clearly very, very talented.
And it was always interesting to hear Michele's thoughts on Italy. And we did speak to him at the World Cup. And he said what we all said in terms of them playing from deep, playing too much rugby. And as he said, Gonzalo Casada hasn't changed too much drastically, but he has got them playing in a more sort of structured way as we thought he would. Yeah, I I, I thought under Crowley they were kind of structured anyway. That Their back line looks really, it's really weird because they're one of the sides in this comp that looks comfortable on ball. Um, like England don't look, look like they know what they're doing with the ball. France kind of look a bit alien at the minute, whereas Italy actually look quite settled and look quite decent with ball in hand. So they've been good to follow. Yes, they played from two deep under Crowley and they were exhausted, whereas now they're a sort of different proposition. If they can keep that ball in hand, the attitude and the way they play together and then be a bit more pragmatic in their own third, um, they're dangerous. And that's where the weird thing is for Scotland, right? They've got Scotland next up. Scotland have just beaten... But as I said earlier, I think that's a really poor England side. So Scotland, Italy, I think that's going to be quite a tight one in Rome uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Right, we'll have a little look at the top 14 shortly and maybe speak a bit about where France go from here selection-wise with the players coming back shortly. But first, we should find out what your metre moment of the week is, Johnny. It wasn't France. Um, Everyone's eyes were on the Six Nations, but I caught some top 14 action back up. I'm not sure if you saw the Parisian derby, but it's been absolutely everywhere on social yeah. media. Penny Dakawanga, hadn't seen much from play before, but a second half try from his own goal line, from behind his own goal line, and he went the length. Absolutely ridiculous. They call him Flash, don't they, Johnny? And that's why. Oh, he's so Flash. He couldn't be any more Flash. Um, he was on the 65th minute as well. By that time, I'm about ready for the game to end. Um, but Fiji and speed, flair, you can only really stand back and applaud. Um, he gathers the ball that's grubbered through. He skins one M off in the dead ball area, chips over everyone in the defensive line outside his own 22, regathers and goes the distance and made it look horribly easy. Um, and we talk about a show and rugby being a spectacle. We want more of it. And to do it in the Parisian Derby makes it even more special. Top class. Um, so that was, by a distance, our metre moment of the weekend. There's the pace. There's the little juggle with the hands, the skill oh, there. All of um, it. You mentioned the carpet that is Racing's Arena. So that's the best place to do it as well in this sort of spaceship with the, all the eyes on you. But it's the audacity to do it, isn't it? To sort of run cross field in your in-goal area then chip from inside your own 22 like it's the it's the boldness but it's also this is why i love the top 14 you wouldn't see that in the urc you wouldn't see that in the premiership because no. you'd get in trouble like you wouldn't even be allowed to try it because a coach would be trying to tell you to be pragmatic or kick out your own you imagine one of borthwick steve borthwick's <laughs> players trying to do that for england they'd never see the jersey again but that is what you get in the top 14 a little bit of magic a little bit of creativity the audacity to try and if it doesn't come off it doesn't come off but it did and it was an absolute worldy and that's probably the try of the season wrapped up already oh it was absolutely beautiful so that's why i love the top 14 because you get things like that so good there we go that was johnny's meter moment of the week and meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer recently making over 20 million cooks better with their game-changing app and completely wireless bluetooth meat probe you can use it on a barbecue, in the oven, or in a pan, and you can get your hands on one at meter.com. Plus, you can get 10% off any full price item. All you have to do is enter the code FRENCHPOD10 at checkout. That's FRENCHPOD10, and you get 10% off any full price item at meter.com. Right, quick one. We mentioned some players coming back for France and a lot of injuries. We'll probably talk more about it next week. Manny Miafu and Thibaut Flamand are back training an in contention yep. for Toulouse this weekend. Mm -hmm. So do you think one or both of them could be playing in round four for France? Yeah, I think both, mate. Um, I reckon it's been a tough old gig for Cameron Walkie. Um I see Thibaut Flamand coming back in as soon as possible. He brings that athleticism mixed with power. Also a good line-out option. Manny Miafu, I think they want to get him capped as soon as possible. And I know Pozzolo has done a wonderful job, but... It might mean that Roman Tau drops out completely and you have two big trucks at five or you bring Pozzolo back onto the bench. But I'd love to see both those boys from Toulouse coming back into the setup and for Manny to get his first cap would be pretty special. Yeah, 100%. And then obviously Jonathan Dante is going to be banned. So who comes in for him? 
Nicholas Depoter or who else is standing in the wings? Um, I, I reckon you're probably more likely, again, with the squad they've got, see Moefana shift back into the centre and then have a Biarri on the bench, on the wing. Then you've got somebody shifting up like Deporter probably to 24th, 25th man, which sucks. It's always a horrible position to be in. But again, it might be if Fabian wants to roll the dice and see a bit more of youth. There's a boy or a guy at home, like either one of those centres, you can bring in and give them a cap and see what they've got. Um, and that's kind of what French rugby public's calling for as well. Um, and I guess the other position is standoff. Now that Mathieu yeah. Jalibert is injured, it's who starts there. If you're looking for continuity, you probably just shift Thomas Ramos into the 10 jersey. Um, Gibert was initially in the squad, hasn't played. Hastoy was dropped out altogether. But if you're looking for the surest thing, Hastoy would be the man yeah. that played in the last World Cup. So it's going to be an interesting choice there for Fabian. Does he bring Ramos up to 10 and then shift his, his, his backfield and, and put somebody else to fullback? Um, so yeah, I'd be interested to see how they train together next week and uh, what side they put together for round four. And if he did shift Ramos to 10, it's not immediately obvious who starts at fullback anymore. Uh, Labelle obviously shifted there during the game, but he, he wouldn't necessarily be picked to start there. Do you know who I reckon has been the best fullback in France for the past three seasons? Brice Doulan. Well, yeah. I know he's old as I am. <laughs> not quite. Well, he's not far off. <laughs> if you want somebody that can catch high balls, kick really well and counter-attack till the cows come home, it is Brice Doulan. And I know they had so much time for Melvin Jaminet, but... He has not been good for Toulouse or for Toulon. And I know he does a certain job well for France with his kick game, but Brice Toulon would have been my man that I would have backed over the past two, three seasons. He hasn't had his chance, so it'll be interesting to see who they shift into backfield for round four. So quickly on the top 14, we talked about it in the meeting moment of the week. Stade Francais are now top after their win away at Racing. They, Racing, they've lost four on the spin now haven't they Johnny so what what's going wrong with them because we were talking about them top of the table the Stuart Lancaster effect everything going well doesn't help they play on a carpet everyone loves going there and we mentioned previously they, they're still a side I think in transition and they don't have the big power athletes where they dominated sides like in the past decade a bit like Toulon um they are lighter and I don't want to say easy to play against um but they're a different proposition right um and no, obviously, they're bringing in Farrell in the off-season, um, a big personality to control things at 10. Also exciting for Henry Arundel to be playing with a guy like Owen Farrell. Mate, I didn't realise that Henry Arundel is going to be Gif. Mm. Did not register that. But because he came over aged, I think, 20, and it's three years before you're 23 as part of a... He's going to be Gif, which is a really interesting dynamic for what he wants to do with his career after this contract. Because the world essentially if he's still ripping it up, will be his oyster. Um, but yeah, generally, Rassing, four on the bounce, also heard that Lancaster might bring his boy over from Ealing. Okay, yeah. He's into the well. academy as well. So there's another one that might be coming over and joining. Um, but yeah, just, again, still another one of those sides in transition um, and not able to sort of fully dominate, certainly in the top 14 yet, but in one-off games... Very impressive, great rugby, and I think they'll only get better under Lancaster. Um, with a few more additions come the recruitment this summer. So what we're saying is Henry Arundel is going to have his pick of lucrative contracts in the top 14 because he's shift. But also, if Borthwick doesn't want him, Fabian might. Potentially. So the, the difference is he's Gif, so he'll qualify through their system and be ultra-valuable to clubs. And I think it's after five years now he'll qualify mm. for the French side. Um, but that's it. What turned out as, I think, an experience and to work under different coaches. And now, you know, Farrell's coming, Stu Lancaster, like you're working with some top class people, personnel, um, to develop your game. Now, where does he go in three years time? The world could be his absolute oyster. Is he going to then try and play for France, which would be bonkers? Um, or does he pick up another move around the top 14 or stay? Because his star will have risen considerably, I imagine, over the next three seasons, which is pretty cool for him. And Montpellier, they're still second bottom, but they've won four of the last five, I think. So they're coming good, aren't they? Yep. Not a fan of what they've done to Paolo Garbisi. Um, that's rubbish, but their form's decent. Um, and the fact that they've had the coaching team come in, uh, a few of the boys that I know really well, Vincent Echetto, Christian Labitte, 
they've had a decent impact. And their form now, I think, is in line with that of Toulouse's. They've got the best form chart in the top 14 with Toulouse, um, which is awesome. They have rocketed their way up. They're now, I think, two points off the next side. So they've gone ahead of Oyana, who they play this weekend, which will be a big game in Oyana. Um, and they're actually, they're, the weird thing about the top 14 is now they're two wins off top six. It's bananas. But if they win this weekend in Oyana, they could go on and actually qualify. What a run that would be. Um, so no, delighted for them. Um, heading down on Thursday and filming with Kobas Reinach as well, which will be cool to get back down to Montpellier, see the sights, maybe doing a bit of horse riding together, which will be interesting, Tim. Okay. Um, Very as you back. do. As you do. Well, not quite the whole hog, but <laughs> as long as I'm Big Spoon, I'm, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> um, but yeah, looking forward to that. And hopefully Montpellier can keep going. And La Rochelle, we saw a week or so ago, I think it was, Ren Nagara sort of calling out a lot of his players saying they were more interested in property on the Ile de Ray than, than rugby at the moment. We saw it earlier in the season where obviously when they have their big names and big men missing, they did struggle. And obviously that is the case to a certain extent at the moment with the Six Nations going on. But there's still a lot of star players there and they not only lost to Perpignan, but Perpignan picked up a bonus point as well. Ah, they've got a lot of injuries though, mate. Like... So you got Antonio's away. You've obviously got Greg that's injured. I was with Will Skelton on the Yield Array. We were looking at the house prices. I'm joking. We weren't. If you're listening, Rog, we weren't. Uh, but Will Skelton has got a little tear in his calf. So he's going to be another four or five weeks. That's it. You've removed the spine of their team. So like once that element of power is gone and you're underpowered, the top 14 is a brutal league. And you might think Perpignan lower end of the table, but it counts for so much at this level. So Again, we mentioned Tommy Allen. He set up a wonderful try for Perpignan. They played really well. Um, and again, I've got a real, I was going to say crush. I've got a real thing for these teams that are in, not for Kobus Reinach in the tent. Um, <laughs> I've got a thing for these teams that work their way through horrible periods at the bottom and then they come up with big wins over big opposition. Because having been there, it gives the it gives everyone in the club such a shot in the arm, such a lift of confidence. It's not nice when you're down there and it's you're in the doldrums. So, no, I was really impressed with Perpignan. La Rochelle, as we were saying, they've still got quite a few men to come back from injury and from the Six Nations. Jack Nowell, another one. He hasn't been involved because he's been injured as well. So, look, the list goes on. It's not an easy season, this one, for La Rochelle. Um, but they'll be hoping come Champions Cup, round of 16, come end of Six Nations, they get everyone back and they can go on a bit of a run like Montpellier. Yeah, not just Champions Cup, it'll be very interesting to see what we're saying in sort of two months' time when we're coming towards the denouement of the top 14 season. You probably would suggest that the likes of La Rochelle will be coming to the fore. Maybe Racing will have risen again, but it's interesting. The, the top 14 is such a grind, as we always say. You cannot win all the time and you are going to have a period of a few weeks where it doesn't go so well. La Rochelle are obviously in that, again, Rassing have lost four on the spin. Another team that we were waxing lyrical about earlier on in the season, ton of players missing and Bordeaux hammered away at cast. But, but again, that is les doublons, the doubles mm. as they call them here. The weekends of Six Nations rugby where some sides are missing half their team. Cast ain't missing anyone. No. They've got They've got everyone back. They are at home. They are also on a crusade for points. And Jack Goodhue's there as well and playing well. Exactly. And he's ripping it up. Uh, and Bordeaux, Matthew Jalibert out injured, at least for another six, seven weeks with his knee. Um, and, and players down. So, I mean, it's normal. It's a sort of opportunity for sides that, again, weirdly, haven't had any of their players rewarded for playing well to be picked up for internationals. Um to try and get some points and gain some ground back on the big dogs, back on your Toulouse's, back on your La Rochelle's, back on your Bordeaux's. And again, I've also got a soft spot for Cass, so I was delighted to see them do one over Bordeaux. And fallow week in the Six Nations again this weekend, but the top 14's there, so what's taking your fancy? Well, you've still got the list of 19 players that have been les privilégiés, as they're called in France, the privileged ones that are um, exempt What's that? Wrapped in cotton wool, mm. exempt from top 14 games. So you've got quite a few players. And again, the bulk are La Rochelle and Toulouse. But this weekend, you've got a few awesome derbies. You've got Toulouse against Cast, Bordeaux Racing, Bayonne against Lyon. Again, that's another 
in the next two weekends, you've got loads of these sides that are going to be duking it out and playing against each other in the sort of bottom six. So we'll know a lot more about the table come the next two rounds. Oyonnax Montpellier, that is huge for the survival of Oyonnax. And also if Montpellier really want to push on and try and make top six, that's a big one for them. And La Rochelle Clermont. Clermont, who lost at home to Toulouse last weekend, they go back on the road, they're back up next to the Ile de Ray. They'll maybe be checking out the house prices as well. Um, but that should be a cracker of a game. So loads going on, some big fixtures this weekend, and mate, it doesn't slow down. That's the thing, is who can survive the Six Nations period and pick up points. And you've had your ear to the ground in the airports and the cafes and the Murrayfield. Heard any rumours or not? Mate, there's a few. Um, there's quite a few at the minute. You've got Stu McCloskey, um, a couple to buy on. So Stu McCloskey from Ulster to buy on. Danny Kerr, who is probably going to pick up his 100th cap in the next couple of weekends. Uh, he's been linked to Bayon and to Perpignan. He's got his choice of clubs there. Hugh Jones, who's close to sealing his deal with Glasgow, potentially to Montpellier. Kerwin Bosch, Montpellier as well. Um, Chris Tolafu obviously went from Toulon to Montpellier last week. Furbank, another one that didn't have his best game for England, but he's been linked to quite a few clubs over in France. So, mate, it, it never, ever ends. And I... I think we're going to see more and more. Again, the other one we didn't talk about last week, officially announced, was Big Courtney Laws till yes. 2026. So he's been announced to breathe. So Good signing it, video as well. Did you see that with his kids? I didn't see it, but it's a nice way to finish, isn't it? Like one club yeah. man, clean break, breathe. He's got a few years. Um, and they'll be delighted to have him as well. Like They were trying to get, I won't mention, a couple of old mates out of their um, contracts back home in the UK, um, but it didn't go through. So they'll be delighted to have got somebody that can play that hybrid role, back row, second row, can be a leader um, and won't mind rolling his sleeves up. So great move for him at the end of career. A nice one for his family. Thanks, Johnny. Big thanks to Michele Campagnaro for joining us. And thanks to all you guys for listening. Make sure you hit subscribe. Leave us a nice review if you can. Check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, Johnny. See you, mate. Bye.